How could Britain, the greatest empire the world had seen since ancient Rome, find itself bottled up in the small provincial town of Boston, and then, after months of misery, be forcibly evicted from that place by a ragged mob of rebels? That conundrum is central to the first year of the American Revolution, as well as the long first act in George Washington's role as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. Part of the answer, of course, is that the British were often outnumbered. From the first day of the war, as the British retreated in disarray from Concord to Boston on April 19, 1775, there were sometimes two to three times more rebels than redcoats in the confrontation. Although Britain had superior naval power in Boston and could come and go by sea, rebel entrenchments and fortifications in a 20-mile ring around the town kept the British from mounting an expedition into the countryside, except for the disastrous sally across the Charles River to Bunker Hill, where a thousand redcoats were killed or wounded on the afternoon of June 17, 1775. More to the point, King George III and the King's men underestimated the difficulty of waging a long war across 3,000 miles of open ocean. Expeditionary warfare, whether waged in North America in the 18th century or in Central Asia in the 21st century, is among the most difficult martial enterprises. The British Army in the Revolution, unable to gather food and forage from the American countryside without being ambushed, relied largely on provisions shipped from English and Irish ports. But, of 550 Lincolnshire sheep sent to feed British troops in occupied Boston, only 40 arrived alive in autumn 1775. Of 290 hogs shipped, just 74 survived the trip. Most of the 5,200 barrels of flour that arrived in one shipment turned rancid during the voyage. Moreover, of 40 transports dispatched from Britain that winter, only eight reached Boston. The rest were blown by gales to the Caribbean or back to Britain, or were intercepted by rebel marauders. That was a significant reason causing General William Howe, the British commander, to contemplate abandoning Boston during the winter of 1775-76. His army was hungry, living badly on salt meat. Howe also calculated that to move his army overland from Boston would require 3,662 horses and 540 wagons. That was almost 3,000 horses and 500 wagons more than he actually had. By midwinter, the British Army was jeopardized by outbreaks of smallpox, dysentery, scurvy, and other diseases. The rebels tormented the redcoats with skirmishes, raids, sniping, and an increasingly pesky naval force that captured British merchant vessels, munition ships, and troop transports along the New England coast. Through all this, Washington did his best to keep his new army intact, despite very spotty discipline, sickness, his own acute shortages of gunpowder and other supplies, and the mass exit of troops when their enlistments expired. The commanding general did his best to conceal from both the enemy and his own ranks how dire things had become. As the weeks and months went by, Washington confided to an aide, could I have foreseen what I have and am likely to experience, no consideration upon earth should have induced me to accept this command. The stalemate began to break when a bulky, bow-legged man named Henry Knox rode into Cambridge in mid-January 1776. A former Boston bookseller with a knack for gunnery, Knox, on Washington's orders, had successfully transported in midwinter, by boat and by sled, 58 large cannons from two former British forts in upstate New York, Ticonderoga and Crown Point. Those guns gave Washington the firepower that he needed. It all came to a climax on March 5, 1776, when the astonished British awoke to find that overnight the Americans had hauled Knox's guns up Dorchester Heights, high ground overlooking Boston. The subsequent bombardment quickly convinced Howe that his occupation of the town was no longer tenable. Over the next two weeks, he organized an evacuation of not only 9,000 redcoats and their military equipment, but 1,200 of their dependents 
and a thousand loyalists, everyone jammed onto 78 ships, which would carry them to Halifax in Nova Scotia. This overcrowded, despondent squadron sailed on March 17th, leaving the British Empire without a single port on the Atlantic seaboard between Canada and Florida. Washington rode into Boston to claim his prize. It won a remarkable victory without fighting a single battle, but the war had really just begun. On sale now, the British are coming. Rick Atkinson's epic story of the American Revolution, available from the shops at Mount Vernon or wherever books are sold.